hey, this is the Missouri River, this is November 2014, over one million ducks and geese. So their numbers are going up. And I told you that wild waterfowl are often the natural reservoir, they harbor this virus, and so what we look at is these flying viral factories. And mostly the waterfowl are either looking for, you know, ponds and streams and lakes to land on, or they are also looking for food. So they may just bed down in a field and they're trying to harvest what's left of corn or soybeans or some other crop that was there. The one thing to remember is that they do like to land on water. Is there anybody here that uses surface or pond water as their source of water for their poultry? Okay, so that's why it's extremely critical that we have a good system of water sanitation. If those wild waterfowl land on a body of water, they're excreting the virus into it, the virus will live in the mud at the bottom of that pond for a long period of time. So at 10 degrees Celsius, that virus will stay alive for 100 days. So this virus likes cold weather conditions. As the water temperature or air temperature warm up, then this virus will start to die off. And the same is true at 10 degrees Celsius. Um, if you had a, a fecal material that's contaminated, it's going to last for a month. If all of a sudden the temperature warms up to 20 degrees Celsius, it's only going to last for seven days. So there have been cases of influenza that occurred in flocks where the chlorinator broke. Okay, so the virus is in the water and that water is coming right into the barns. The other things that we look at is just contact. People that are in contact with infected fecal material Okay, so it's not just that somebody like in this picture where you can obviously see it on the bottom of their shoe. Maybe this is somebody that's out working in fields in the springtime, getting them ready, and um, a lot of waterfowl have landed in that area and you're stirring up a lot of that material. The other thing we always have to be aware of is the outside of the barn is always a dirty zone or contaminated. So all of our biosecurity is to try to keep what's on the outside out, what's on the inside in. So if you have a piece of equipment that you're storing outside of your barn, okay, if you're having uh, birds flying overhead and you're getting droppings, if you're not disinfecting that piece of equipment before it goes back in your barn, that can be a risk to you. And then we have these little tiny, you know, little birds, whether they're sparrows or starlings, and they are often the connection between where the wild waterfowl are and then they're coming onto your farm. So wild bird, uh, strategies to lessen the reason for them to even want to come to your farm are quite important. There are main migratory flyways. Birds don't always stick to the rules. But this particular virus, the H5N2, was isolated in every flyway except for the Atlantic flyway, so the blue one. Where did the high path influenza cases occur? in the red, the green, and in the yellow, but not in the blue. So it told us that um, this virus was likely, you know, maybe within that wild bird population for a longer period of time than had been anticipated. Because although we do a lot of surveillance on uh, commercial poultry, there has not been a lot of funding that was done on wild bird surveillance. How is this virus different? Okay, so I told you people have been used to dealing it. How is this one different? Dr. Mia Torchetti is with USDA. So she's one of these people that, you know, looks at the virus, does all the genetic analysis, trying to figure out the similarities. Because there's some slight differences in the virus that allows them to actually look at where it might have come from. And the one thing that became obvious is there was evidence for two things, both a single point introduction and introductions that occurred in widely spaced geographic areas at the same time. And also she was able to look at some that are linked, so you'll see the circle and ones coming out from it, where she said, These, this cluster, they're all the same. So it's a spread perhaps that involved biosecurity breaches or something else that allowed it to spread. The first three cases that occurred in about a 10 day period were in three different states, each about 300 kilometers apart. The other thing that was different about this virus is when it first started, a lot of people said, we feel an industry um, 
experience was this is being spread by the wind. This is aerosolized spread. And oftentimes when we can't find any other connection between two locations, like is it wild birds? Do they share a common dead bird pit? You know, is there, are there equipment that's shared or people? When we can't find that, then sometimes we think that it may be aerosolized. The one thing that they were looking at at this, the, the time of year that this occurred and the geography in the area, it was conducive to windborne spread of feathers and dust and also people were commenting that people were out in the fields, they were turning them over, and little pieces of corn stubble were showing up on the screens on the barn. So they were looking at perhaps that might have been the connection between the two. So aerosolized spread of any type of virus really depends on the weather conditions. The warmer it gets, the virus will drop off, and the size of the particle and the distances. But if you look at this, if you look at proximity between a positive source of influenza, or it could be a mycoplasma, and there's your farm. If the prevailing winds are coming this way, depending on your barn orientation, so they're all like this, there's a possibility or higher risk that if that farm is positive, depending on the distance and wind speeds, it can get into your barns. The other one too is if we're not detecting infected flocks prior to movement, whether they're going to the slaughter plant, whether we're moving birds from a conditioning farm to a lay farm, that, that flock may be on a truck and because your farm has a close proximity to the road, feathers are blowing off and they're gonna be coming onto your property. So that's something that was of a major concern. The other one that they followed up with is USDA said, well, let's start doing some sampling. So they actually did air sampling of infected flocks inside the barn, which obviously was highly contaminated or high viral load. But immediately outside the barns was also a high viral load. So if you think about where are you parking your cars on that farm, where does that vehicle go afterwards? It becomes a huge biosecurity risk. So you have to think about Outside the barn is a dirty, contaminated area. What measures are you going to take to make sure you don't drag the outside inside the barn? When they looked at the uh, layer population, they found positive uh, air samples up to 150 meters away from barns and suspect samples up to a, a kilometer away. So it said that there is good evidence from field experience and also from some monitoring to say that, yes, aerosol spread was part of the way that this virus was being spread. What USDA also did is they did what's called plume modeling. And so what you're doing is they went back to when a farm turned positive, they looked at the weather for that particular time and they pulled up what were the wind speeds during the period of time that these birds would have been infected. And these birds, when I say they're infected, it means large amounts of virus is being ventilated out of those barns. You know, what would be the direction and where would it go? So what you see here is a black dot is a poultry facility. A red dot is an infected farm. A yellow dot is an infected farm that became infected within the plume of that first farm. So really what they were able to say is that if you are located within the plume of an infected farm, you're five to four times more likely to become infected. So it's one of those things that it's not just the biosecurity on your farm, but then it becomes what are your neighbors doing? What as an industry are we doing to help control the spread? The ex from exposure to onset of signs, field observations said it depended on whether they thought it might have come in via aerosol. The agreement from most between field observations and the science behind it is it's most likely about five days from the time that birds are exposed to birds are going to start showing some clinical signs. The other one is that this uh, disease occurred in farms that had higher biosecurity levels, so farms that were showering facilities and also ones that were solid-sided barns. The older in turkeys, the, I think the youngest turkeys affected were 12 weeks, so it primarily affects older birds. And what was very interesting is in all of this midst, broilers were not affected. 